we will get going. Um, as you may know, we're also live streaming this webinar on Facebook this afternoon. So we're just getting that set up before we kick off properly, but it looks like that is up and running now. So probably without further ado, I might see if we can kick off. Um, Tiano and um, Eugenie, do you wanna come on? There you are. Kia ora. nice to see you. Um, kia ora tato kato, na mihi um, kia koto, no mai haida mai ki tene hui. Uh, tuatahi hakarakia, hakarakia tato. Fakataka te ho ki te iru, fakataka te ho ki te tonga, ki a makina ki a ki uta, ki a matara tara ki tai. E hia ki ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he ho hunga. Homi e hui e tai ki e. Kia ora, no mai haida mai. Uh, ko Pete Huggins toko ingoa, e mahi ana uh, at uh, Soil and Health Association, uh, mō te kaupapa oranga nuku, oranga kai, oranga tangata. No mai haere mai ki te hui o te Pāti Kākariki o Aotearoa. Uh, welcome everyone um, to this afternoon's hui. Um, it's great to see so many people uh, join. My name is Pete Huggins. I'm the general manager of the Soil and Health Association. I'm very pleased to be invited to help facilitate this web webinar this afternoon for the Greens. Uh, very shortly, we're going to hand over to our MPs to do a little bit of an introduction, and then I've got some follow up questions for them. And then what we're going to do is we're going to open it up a bit wider. So if you have questions um, on the emissions reduction plan as it stands, how to make a submission, any of the content that you've heard from the MPs, do feel free to put that uh, in the chat this afternoon. And Lauren and Sean, uh, who is who are supporting their webinar this afternoon, will feed those questions to me and I can put them to the MPs on your behalf. So I think that's everything from me. Um, just another warm welcome to you all. Uh, this afternoon we have um, Eugenie Sage, uh, Green Party Environment Spokesperson, and Tiano Tuyono, Green Party Agriculture Spokesperson, to uh, relate to you the um, government's draft emissions reduction plan and talk about how that relates to agriculture and, and how it needs to strengthen. Um, Tiano, do you want to uh, kick us off if I hand over to you um, and you can introduce yourself and um, take it away? Uh, kia ora, uh, tēnā tātou i te whānau. Uh, kia ora everyone, uh, my name is Tiano Toyono, uh, Green Party spokesperson for lots of stuff, but today I uh, spoke for, for agriculture and I'm coming from rural Manawatu. Um, if you hear some weird noises, it's not my uh, uh, terrible rural broadband, it's actually the rain outside. Um, so that's the situation with the weather, weather today. Um, uh, so yeah, a little bit about myself. I live out here, here, here in here in the rural Manawatu, really passionate about provincial communities, rural communities, because I live out here. Um, some of the things that we've been pushing for in, in this space has been recently around um, trying to uh, draw attention to deforestation in places like Indonesia and uh, and PKE and and the real real need to to, to to ban the use of PKE because it's it's bad for the environment here but also bad for deforestation and the displacement of wildlife and and indigenous people's communities overseas as well. Um, also. Uh, I also acknowledging the uh, launch of the organics uh, plan last week as well. And I think there's a really important uh, space for people that are involved in organics and also in regenerative agriculture in terms of how we get that transition to transition uh, from more intensive uh, farming to more sustainable and regenerative and organic organic farming farming as well. So I definitely see that there is a, a place to play in that as well. Um, and acknowledging that the organic bill should be should have been passed through the, the house last week, but it didn't, and the week before, but it didn't. So it might show up this week or the week after. And then, what does that actually mean for all of us in terms of the support policies that are needed to actually make that make that happen? Um, and what does that mean for us in terms of uh, domestically with here in Aotearoa, New Zealand as well? Um, hi, what's PKA? That's a palm kernel expeller. So it's a byproduct of uh, a palm oil plantations. It's just a question up there as well. But that, that's it for me from Ralph. So kia ora, everyone. Oh, kia ora, Tiana. Um, Eugenie, do you want to give a brief introduction? Kia ora koutou kato, nā mihi nui ki a koutou. Uh, ko Eugenie Se Jaho, ko, um, I'm a Green MP um, based here in the Whakaraupo, Littleton Harbour Basin on Banks Peninsula. 
there are sheep and cattle grazing up the road and I was agricultural spokesperson last term uh, and currently most relevant to this is as environment uh, spokesperson and alongside uh, Tiano's work on organics and PKA and other issues have been pushing the government on nitrate. I was asking questions of the Associate Health Minister last week about the recent studies around nitrate in fresh water and the potentially increased risks of colorectal cancer. New Zealand's got very high rates of that. Uh, and just trying to persuade the government to take that more seriously. Um, also chair the Environment Committee and Steve Abel uh, and Greenpeace have got a very good petition which the committee is considering about banning uh, synthetic nitrogen fertiliser and so we've been having a range of organisations from the Fertiliser Association to Federated Farmers to Greenpeace just providing evidence on that and getting a wider range of MPs in the Labour National and, um, Act caucuses aware of some of the uh, issues and um, pushing the government on the changes to the national environmental standards that uh, David Parker and Damien O'Connor uh, announced recently, weakening the standards around wetlands, uh, around the buffers, uh, around high country lakes, and just pushing hard on the environmental regulation area. But really interested in this, Zoe, on the emissions reduction plan, agriculture, and working to help people make submissions by the 24th of November um, on the ERP emissions reduction plan. Kia ora, back to you, Pete. Oh, kia ora, Eugenie. Yes, so uh, for those of you um, who've just joined us, we've had a few people join a little bit late. Um, we've just heard a little bit from um, Tiano and, and Eugenie by way of introduction. This webinar is the emissions reduction plan and, and climate change is the key issue. Um, although, as Eugenie says, there's a there's a multitude of related issues um, environmentally beyond just climate change. Uh, so what we're going to do now is a bit more scene setting. Um, and I've got some questions I'm going to put to the MPs um, just to try and tease out some of those um, climate related issues. Uh, and as I encouraged before, if you have questions, do pop them in the chat um, and we will get to those um, probably at about half past or 25 to we'll start um, opening it up um, a little bit more broadly. Right, so uh, the emissions reduction plan, um, I think it might be good just to start um, with some with some basics, perhaps I can turn to you, um, Eugenie, um, what is the emissions reduction plan, uh, you know, why, why is it so important in particular around New Zealand's climate change response? Well, people have heard the Conference of Parties um, in Scotland has finished um, today. The emissions reduction plan was government's response to the advice of the Independent Climate Commission uh, earlier this year about, about what our pathway would be to reduce emissions. And uh, it, we've come out with a what our nationally determined contribution is, i.e. what Aotearoa New Zealand is saying to countries around the world um, that we will contribute to keeping the rise in global temperatures to uh, no more than 1.5 um, degrees. And the emissions reduction plan is recognising that every single minister and government agency has got a responsibility to reduce our emissions. And what is really um, troubling about the plan is that there are only three and a half pages in it uh, devoted to agriculture. So the Ministry for Primary Industries and Agribusiness generally has not taken uh, our need to reduce emissions seriously in my view. Um, people know that agriculture contributes 48% uh, of New Zealand's emissions and those emissions from agriculture have increased by 17% since 1990. And yet in the Emissions Reduction Plan, which is open for submissions uh, until the 24th of November, there is a reliance um, by uh, the government agencies on this uh, Iwaka Ekanoa, which is a voluntary partnership with the agribusiness sector, uh, where farmers have got to come up with some thoughts about how they're going to reduce emissions on farm, develop a bit of a plan, but it's all voluntary. And next year, uh, in around, I think, March, government will look at what's been uh, developed through Iwaka Ekanoa, decide whether it's adequate, and the Climate Commission will be involved in that process, and then decide whether to use the provisions in the Zero Carbon Act, uh, to bring agriculture into the ETS at the processor level um, before 2025. 
but I think the Emissions Reduction Plan, or ERP, the very cursory way in which agriculture is dealt with is a real problem. MPI and its minister really need to engage because agriculture contributes 48% of our emissions. Thanks, Shishani, that's, that's really clear. Um, so um, can I just ask a follow-up question to that? Uh, you know, you've talked about how the ERP uh, almost sort of refers to this other process that's going on on, on outside and as a punch of business. Um, if we compare that to, say, for example, transport or energy or any of the other um, emissions areas, um, you're saying there's a lack of detail, there's a lack of specific concrete actions, is that right? Yeah, I mean, in the transport section, there's just um, quite detailed, uh, whether it's uh, increasing uh, electric vehicles, banning the import of um, internal combustion uh, engines potentially from 2030, a lot of specific policies about how we can reduce emissions. But in agriculture, what it's focusing on is research. And there was another 21 million in this budget on top of the 200 million that has been spent on the past 20 years in the hope of developing some silver bullets uh, to reduce emissions. And one of the things that Rod Oram, um, if anyone's been looking at his uh, newsroom uh, articles from COP in Glasgow, has highlighted is the seriousness with which um, Nestle, which of course Fonterra is um, its biggest uh, customer is Nestle, uh, is looking at reducing emissions in the agricultural sector by moving more to things like regenerative agriculture. Whereas here in Aotearoa, um, our agribusiness sector is saying, well, per kilogram of milk solids or per kilogram of meat, our emissions are lower than comparable countries overseas. That means we don't have to do anything. The rest of the world is changing and recognising that agriculture has got to do its part, but that's certainly not the message that is in the Emissions Reduction Plan, and it's the message that people need to put in their submissions, that agriculture has to do so much more. Build up. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Eugenie. Now, we've got some great questions coming through, and we're going to um, take those and, and address those uh, later and group them together. Um, but let's keep going through some of these ones that I've got prepared. I'm going to come to you, Tiano. Um, as the Greens, obviously, we have to Tiri to or Waitangi as a key um, part of the constitution for the party. So can you talk to us a little bit about um, meaningful involvement from Tanga to Fenema in this conversation and, and you know, what this looks like in a Tiri context, if we were writing the ERP? Yeah, um, well, uh, probably just to put some context around it, the Hewaka he Ekenor, they do have... They do have Māori involved in that, but that is an industry industry body as well. It's got a nice fancy Māori name, so people kind of think, well, actually, that sort of thing's being taken care of there. But actually, there are wider con uh, there are wider concerns, and and iwi and, and hapu always have their own way of going about and doing things. Um, and uh, my, my interactions with different uh, people working in the Māori agriculture sector is, is often they just kind of get on get on with it. Um, but we do need to have something that is that sits over that, so that, that extra layer of accountability. We are the Greens, the TC Waitangi is actually a part of our a part of our charter to making sure that that, that holistic view is actually there um, is really, really important. So that is around partnering up with um, with Hapu and Iwi. Uh, and then also, and in that way, you get a kind of like a wider view on it. Uh, when I have talked to, to different uh, uh, folks as well that are within the, within, within the industry, um, one thing that I have noticed is that there is more of a longitudinal view on these things, so it's not just about the short-term profit. It's about well, what does this mean for my tamariki? What does this mean for our for our mukapuna? That is something that is, I think, should be should be would be really important to emphasise in, in any submissions as well. But definitely making sure that we have those those connections um, uh, with iwi and and with hapu and people that are uh, within those communities is really really important. That's your name. Any further points on that, or should we move on to the next question? Eugenie, did you have anything to add in that space? No, move on, I think, Pete. Copway, copway. Uh, so we've touched on this a little bit. You've talked about the 48% of, of emissions um, behind the farm gate there. Someone pointed out in the comments is that there's other emissions from energy and other bits and pieces. But um, Eugenie, can you just expand a little bit more on uh, why, why agriculture is so important? And you, you touched on this before, but anything you want to add there? 
Um, well, 48% of our emissions, and the emissions have increased by 86% since 1990, and that has largely been because of the increase in the dairy sector. Uh, and the increase in the dairy sector has been enabled partly by the massive increase of 670% uh, in synthetic nitrogen fertiliser since 1990. That's allowed more grass to be grown and more stock um, to be farmed. So our emissions from dairy cattle have, um, have increased by about 129% um, since 1990. Uh, someone's asked for references, um, can provide those, um, I'll try and provide them um, after I've spoken. And the problem with all that increase in synthetic nitrogen fertiliser, which at 670% increase since 1990 is far greater than uh, European countries, and that's contributed. Uh, so we need to reduce cow numbers. We need to reduce or ban the phase out the use of synthetic nitrogen um, to actually get our agricultural emissions down. We can't rely on a silver bullet uh, to reduce methane uh, through cow's digestion. We need to actually reduce uh, stock numbers. Thanks for that, Eugenie. I know that's something that's come up um, in the comments and the questions. So we may come back to that issue of destocking a little bit later on. Um, moving on then, and back to you, Tiano. Um, we've just got a couple more questions here before we go to the chat. Uh, much is made of the importance of a just transition. And we know that um, agricultural communities across New Zealand are, you know, will be concerned about the impacts of climate change and the impacts of government policy um, on their livelihoods. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, for farmers and rural communities, how can we can ensure fairness and equity yeah, well, I, I think it's really important to look at this from the from the community level, because um, it um, and it is it is about farms and it is about people that own the farms, and make sure that they transition to more regenerative uh, practices, and organic practices, and those sorts of things as well. But those communities aren't just the people that own the land as well. There are there are the workers as well. Uh, there are the people that uh, you know fix the fences, uh, you know uh, sheep um, sheep shearers. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the folks that work around where I live, you know, they're helping to move the trucks and so on and so forth. So making sure that there's a just transition for workers, um, and I, I know that's something that the CTU has been pushing as well, and and and, and trade unions. So making sure that's part of the mix is, is actually actually really important. But in terms of that that transition, and I think it would be interesting to interesting for people to think about in terms of these submissions, is um, is what, what do their support policies look like, right? So if you're going to help someone transition from A to B to something that's more more, more regenerative, what can EPIA do in terms of the sorts of funding that should be uh, put into making sure that those things happen? Um, what, does that, what does that mean in terms of things like, uh, like the, the situation that we have in, with the moment with the supermarket duopoly? Uh, what is the part that, we're, that organics and regenerative can play in, in that space? Because once we start talking about that, uh, we can then talk about like helping to find different ways for entire communities to move from the reliance on intensive farming, the reliance on intensive dairy to other ways of other ways of doing things. Thanks, Charlie. Eugenie, you've got anything to add there? No, sounds good. Not quite. Um, I'll come back to you then for this last one. This is a bit of a tricky one um, then, or sort of some overlapping issues here. Uh, you know, we've talked about um, the emissions uh, profile of agriculture being really important. Um, but we've also talked about the restoration of ecosystems, or at least we've talked about fresh water quality and so forth. To what extent do you think the emissions reduction plan needs to address those wider environmental issues? Um, and what else, you know, what else can we do to, to restore the whenua? Kia ora, Pete. Great question. Thank you. Um, so one of the encouraging things about the COP um, negotiations in Glasgow has been the increased recognition that we've got a nature crisis as well as a climate crisis. And if we invest in restoring Papatuanuku, we have benefits uh, not only for the climate, but a whole lot of benefits uh, in terms of reduction of soil erosion for our biodiversity, for um, our well-being. So about... Um, half of the biodiversity on private land is on sheep and beef farms. So we need much uh, more effective ways of ensuring that sheep and beef farmers are encouraged to protect uh, indigenous uh, forest and shrublands on their land. One of the key problems at the moment that they face is getting those areas into the ETS because the 
um, assessment of whether they um, are appropriate for carbon forestry, uh, the criteria are really difficult to apply. And I've been out on Banks Peninsula and just on, there's a lot of regeneration on really steep land, and yet the landholders are expected to go over that um, physically and assess the uh, species present and whether they're uh, going to fit the lookup tables that MPI has. So making it easier for regenerating Indigenous to get into the uh, ETS, uh, getting the national policy statement on indigenous biodiversity out so that we've got consistent regulation around the country and more incentives for the protection of biodiversity because the biggest investment we could make on Aotearoa would be much more pest control on our native forests and shrublands to enable them to sequester carbon and to provide all of those landscape scale uh, benefits as well. So we've got to deal with the climate crisis and the nature crisis together. Great, thanks, Shishani. Kilda. Right, okay. Um, well, before we go to some of the questions from the chat, um, any kind of final thoughts, wrap up comments, things? Yeah, that uh, probably, have? probably one thing from for me. I mean, I've, I've sort of just kind of been dipping in and out of the stuff that's been happening over at over at the COP. But uh, another part which kind of links and links with with the importance of Matoa and Māori is. Uh, a greater recognition of Indigenous people's rights. Um, there was something that Indigenous people were pushing at the COP, and I, I, I don't know where that in, ended up, whether it ended up in the preambular text or in some of the more operational parts of, of the text as well. But I, I think that is a recognition that when you support um, Indigenous peoples and you support Māori people and you have that Chatuiti framework, well, then that then all of the things that follow on from that help help with our help with our mission. So that's the recognition of ancestral land ownership and kaitiaki in particular in rural areas, making sure that you we work with hapu to ensure you know appropriate access to particular areas as well, and right down towards towards education as well. There's a whole lot of there's a whole lot of things that can be done when we empower indigenous peoples uh, and, and in particular Maori people living in rural communities to really. Um, to embed in those, uh, embed in Mātauranga Māori, recognising that those, that the, the premise of that is those connections that people have with each other, but also to rivers, mountains, and, and to wahi tapu as well. And if you, if we emphasise that, those relationships, um, that can help uh, move a whole lot of things that are good for the environment. Right, I'm going to start with a few um, questions of clarification or sort of technical questions about the process, um, because I think that's a good place to start with these sorts of things. We've had people ask some questions, and I might I might look to you for this, Eugenie. Um, you've mentioned the date, November the 24th, is closing for submissions. Um, can you just outline for us? There's two parts to this question. Can you first outline for us what sort of happens next after that? You know, what you know, what can we see, and what further opportunity for engagement there is. And secondly, there was a specific question about, there's a link to the Green Party submission guide in the chat and people can go in there and lodge a submission. People can also go through the MFE website. Do you have any guidance for people on what the best way to, to, to do that is? Um, it's fine to go to action.greens.org at that link and we have got a submission guide there, but it's always good to add in your own material. So it's also fine, obviously, to submit directly through the MFE website. And as I said, submissions close on Wednesday, the 24th of November. There will be a lot of submissions from agribusiness interests uh, opposing any change in the current proposals around agriculture. So it's really helpful if people make submissions calling for um, much more comprehensive and real action on reducing agricultural emissions through things like um, reducing um, stocking uh, numbers. And in terms of what happens next, uh, submissions will be assessed and analysed over the Christmas period and there'll be a more final plan that comes out around about May uh, next year. Thank you very much. Oh, and just note too that I think the groundswell movement, which was really opposing um, any increased regulation with all their tractor protests earlier this year, they've got another action day planned, I think on the 21st of November. So the agribusiness lobby in New Zealand is huge and it's very effective at mobilising. And so that's why it's important for others to um, share your views uh, as a counter to all of the submissions that will be coming in from that sector. Great. Okay. Um, so we had uh, several questions that quoted or talked about uh, regenerative agriculture, soil carbon, uh, those sorts of uh, co-papa. 
can someone um, speak to the green stance on this and 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 advise people on what, what they could put in their submissions if they're really wanting the government to adopt a stronger um, regenerative agriculture and organics policy? Um, yeah, I, well, I would say, first of all, take a look at the strategy document that was launched last, last week. Um, it's, a good, it's a good place to start as well. Look, we've always uh, supported uh, organics and the transition to regenerative agricultural um, practices, and that, that's really important. I think that's really important to actually have have in, our, have in our submissions. Uh, and I agree with you, Janie, don't get distracted by the research stuff. Um, we've only got eight years, eight harvests to actually deal with this kind of stuff. And often with research and development, that's 20 years, right? So 20 years is too long. So um, uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you can on the research part of it, uh, make sure that it can happen like yesterday, the, the types of research that you're talking about, or otherwise, don't worry about it. And um, an emphasis on, uh, on, on stopping synthetic fertilizers and PKE and PKM and those those sorts of things are really, really important because it makes sure that when people are doing the things that they need to, doing what the things that they need to do on the land, that they're not pushing and breaking the environmental boundaries as well. So that could be an important place to look at as well. But then also straight up the funding needed to actually help people transition. Where is it? You, you, you know what I mean? Where is it? We, we have what big, big agri business shows up to Parliament all the time asking for all the things, uh, for research things, because they'll be asking for re research dollars. And I heard um, some groups showed up asking for $20 million to monitor methane when actually, where is the money for the organic sector? I mean, where is it? Um, um, there was there was that strategy and I, I understand MPIA helped that. But the next step is, well, actually, what are you, what are you going to do? Um, you have all these different ways of helping to support people who are doing the stuff to access um, markets to you know to sell their produce and all that kind of stuff but you need that you need that wraparound support um, so that would be definitely something to push uh, to push in your submissions as well the people that are doing the things that we need them to do need to be supported to continue to do the things that they they need to do as well um, and then also what does that mean um, uh, just nationally and domestically as well because not everybody wants to sell a whole lot of stuff to overseas. Um, so what does that mean for them? What kind of support can they have in order to make sure that they are, um, you know, issues around food sovereignty, issues around uh, um, uh, Māori ways of looking at organics, who are parakore and all those kinds of things. Where is the support for those? Because those things can help us with all the questions that are coming through around sequestering carbon, making sure you have healthy, nutritious kai, uh, making sure... Um, that when you, you do the things that you need to do, you're not using PKE, PKM or synthetic fertilizers and all those kinds of things as well. So I would like to see some, some submissions around that, around those support policies, around, um, uh, around all those things, helping to empower the people that are already doing the things that we can do as well, but also having that holistic approach around our communities. Um, so we're not just focusing on, uh, uh, focus on people that have the land, the land of gentry, but also as a community as a whole, what can we do to help these communities? Let's think about it from a community perspective. Thanks, Tiana. One of the specific questions was, do we support the, the billion, I think it's a billion dollars that uh, Greenpeace New Zealand has, has suggested is required to support um, farmers to switch into regenerative. I mean, is it worth people putting a figure on that kind of fund? And, and also, um, is there any thinking whether, um, there's also a lot of questions coming in about, um, market-based versus just paying for people to do the thing can anyone speak to to where you guys land how people can address the market the market-based system the ets system in their submissions so i think um in our farming for the future policy last election um, we had a number of suggestions in terms of moving towards a more regenerative system there's a debate about whether there should be some specific standards for what constitutes regenerative agriculture i think personally it's probably a bit early um, to do that and also don't want to get into the situation we've got with organics where there's quite a and government has to really support people make the transition instead of expecting uh, anyone interested in organics to pay all the certification fees themselves it's the support that needs to be provided for that sector whereas in the past we spent 100 million um, fighting mycoplasma boza so there has been a lot of um, sort of subsidy for the sector for traditional agriculture, but not um, new ways of doing things. Um, so some uh, high rates of depreciation for anyone uh, looking to move away from dairy for all the capital equipment like new milking sheds that uh, they have invested. Much more encouragement of um, plant-based uh, diets uh, by government and 
in Canterbury, for example, we still have got a significant arable sector, but used to have a much more extensive one. So how can we get more farmers to move away from um, dairy cows and back into arable? Um, talking to farmers about that, but I think the point that Tiano made, particularly for uh, a just transition, also really involves working with the unions around workers, unions like the dairy sector, unions and others because of the number of people who rely um, on the food and fibre sector for uh, jobs, not just the, the landholders, not just the farmers. Thanks, Eugenie. And now we're going to jump around a little bit. Um, can I, I'm going to ask about forestry. Um, do you see that policies to support conversion of borderline um, hill country into forestry is still an important part thing to be pushing as part of this ERP? So one of the problems with our whole climate policy is the reliance on forestry and carbon sequestration instead of reducing emissions. And have been out with 50 Shades of Green into the Wairapa and seen some of that um, hill country which is going into pines. Um, permanent pine is not the answer. Anything permanent needs to be indigenous. And if we moved to things like planting totara, and the Greens have got a whole policy here which Jeanette Fitzsimons really developed, totara doesn't need any of the chrome arsenic, uh, copper chrome arsenic that is used to treat plantation pine to um, provide it for a safe building timber. Things like totara on the peninsula, you see totara fence posts that are over 100 years old because it's got that natural durability. So we need to really change our forestry industry um, to one where we're focusing on planting more natives and any permanent forest for carbon sequestration should be um, indigenous rather than uh, pine. And the National Environmental Standard for Plantation Forestry was really done by MPI rather than MFE and the forestry industry um, in the last national government. The Greens have been pushing really hard to get that reviewed and James has got some work started on that because it is incredibly permissive in the land, the uh, particularly overplanting of indigenous where these um, carbon forests can be planted. And potentially New Zealand ends up having to pay out a lot under the ETS. So um, share many of the concerns of Fifty Shades of Green about what has happened with um, pine planting here. Well done. Uh, I'm going to ask you about another uh, technical technical question here about a particular way of mitigating or reducing emissions, which is this use of methane inhibitors. Um, there's a question here about, you know, should should methane inhibitors or other technological solutions um, be proposed here, or should we be shying away from those? Um. I think Tiana may want to add, but the first experiments with those, they were seen, um, they were applied to pasture, I think, uh, and they were seen as reducing methane, but they did uh, have some of the subsidiary um, components show up in the milk. So they have been seen as a bit of a silver bullet. You give something to animals um, or you apply it to the pasture and it reduces their burping. Uh, but no, we need to change our farming practice, we need to reduce animal numbers, we need to phase out synthetic fertiliser and not rely on silver bullet solutions which have potentially got other implications. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally totally support that. Um, you know, we've only got eight, eight harvests, so eight, <clears throat> eight or so years to, to deal with this, and if any research is still in the experimental phase, it's not going to be ready to actually do the things because it takes a long time to actually make sure that that's done. Can, can can be rolled out. So uh, silver bullets won't work. Um, it's really important that we focus on reducing stock numbers uh, and also supporting the people to do the things that they are already doing in terms of transitioning towards more regenerative agricultural practices. Well done. Um, turning to uh, a couple of the um, headline policies that, that have been discussed in this meeting, one, one was around phasing out synthetic nitrogen um, and another one was uh, encouraging destocking or reducing herd numbers in particular. Um, we're getting questions around those and, and in particular, what advice do you have? If people are writing a submission, uh, is there a date? Is there a percentage reduction? Like what, what, how do you have a view on how, how fast, how hard and in what way the phase out of synthetic nitrogen and the reduction in, in herd numbers needs to be expressed by submitters? Okay. 
tomorrow. <laughs> you go, Tiano. <laughs> I was like the harder the faster, man. Uh, I mean, that's kind of. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I think it's it's important important to to make make the make the point. Um, yeah, like with 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 the, with the PKE uh, situation as well. I mean, it it is a do, it is a double whammy, and uh, I, I and and I think it's really important that we don't just see that we we understand this within the context of climate change, but there are other things happening as well. Um, you know, there's the bio there's the biodiversity aspect as well, but then it's also happening. There's also what happens when these things come in from other countries. So PKE comes on, shows up in a nice, lovely packet, but we and we look at it and we think that it's great, but actually. Often it's coming from places where that is it's deforested rainforests, um, the displaced indigenous peoples, um, and for folks that have been following the stuff around blood phosphate, that that phosphate coming in from the Western Sahara and the impact that it has there as well. Um, and so it's bad here because it it, it encourages intensive farming, but then also um, pushes the pushes the environmental boundaries, actually breaks them in many ways. But it's also bad for overseas a, a, as well. Um, and so I think. For me, it's like the sooner, the sooner, the sooner the better. Um, and getting getting to that point where we're encouraging people to 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 farm in a way that is consistent with with the environmental boundaries of, of, of that fenua, um, that you're not bringing in other stuff. You bring in another stuff, it means that you're not that it's it's not you know you're not you're not you're not farming um, in a way that is that works with that piece of land. Working, working with that piece of fenua, that's what we need to be encouraging. For. I think um, someone else has asked a question about why is agriculture not in the ETS. Um, that was because of the lobbying of the sector, because it would increase their costs um, in the uh, meantime, in terms of having to pay the equivalent um, of their, their methane and nitrous oxide emissions, uh, that would increase farmers' operating costs. So there was a real push against agriculture being uh, in the ETS. But in terms of what is happening internationally, and um, encourage people to read uh, Rod Oram's columns, what's been happening at COP, is that uh, if farmers don't act now, and if we if we don't act as a country to shift to more regenerative agriculture and to reduce our agricultural emissions, um, New Zealand will really be caught out both in the trade space um, and continue to be a pariah internationally. We got Fossil of the Day Award um, earlier uh, this week. And one of our major problems at the moment is that we are going to be offsetting two thirds of our emissions by um, buying, um, trading in ETSs overseas or investing in other countries, uh, particularly in Asia and the Pacific, to enable them to adapt and offset their emissions. We could also be um, doing more for carbon sequestration in Aotearoa by investing in predator control um, here. So. At the moment, our emissions reduction plan relies far too heavily on offsetting two thirds of our emissions rather than bringing our overall emissions down. And because agriculture is 48% of our emissions, that's why we need to concentrate there. And, and also, it's like the, the damage to international reputation as well. You know, if we organize, if, if New Zealand organizes itself, you get ahead of the get ahead of the market because this is where everyone's heading towards. Everybody wants to be regenerative. Everybody wants needs to be organic, and uh, nobody wants to be importing in your carbon emissions because you didn't organize yourselves properly as well. Um, and so, but the question uh, that I have is: Yes, agriculture, because of the lobbying of the of agri business in the in the last parliament and previous parliaments, is they've gotten a massive hallway pass. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is: What they did with that hallway pass? Well, they, what will they do between now and next year with that hallway pass? And do they deserve to actually still have it um, if if they're continuing to slow things up? Because there's the there's the there's the there's the piece with the international reputation as well. But then also, what other other markets that we are when we are we're um, imp, um, exporting into as well are asking questions as well. So there was some stuff around glyph glyphosate earlier this year. Japan didn't want the honey because it had glyphosate in it as well. So. Uh, sometimes when you talk to people, you, you tell them about the, the, your concerns over the health and on the impacts on health. And um, if you if you didn't watch it this week, uh, check out the question that you, Janie, did ask the, the Minister, uh, Minister for um, Health, Aisha Varel, as well, um, because the health dimension can be another way to sort of look at it as well. But then some, but sometimes they don't listen to that. And sometimes you, you talk to them about the environmental impacts and they, they don't want to listen to that as well. But when it starts to become economic as well, which is what happened with, in the case of um, honey, um, exports to Japan, well then then, uh, then the question is, well, 
you've got we've got health concerns, we've got environmental concerns, but guess what? We've got economic concerns as well. So what 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 what's the deal here? Um, we really need to put the pressure on to make sure that we can uh, do all we can do to help help this country transition. Thanks, thanks, Chalain. Um For those looking for a, a recommendation of a, of a hard date or a hard percentage for uh, nitrogen reduction or um, synthetic fertilizer reduction or destocking, my suggestion is pick pick a date, pick a figure, uh, make it soon. Um, you know, the people reading these submissions are just going to get the impression that there's appetite and there's energy for um, winding those things down. So I think that's the key thing is if, that, if that's your key issue, put that in the submission and, you know, say 2025, um, why not? Um, I'm going to um, pivot now a little bit um, to uh, community, uh, uh, local food networks, um, community composting, um, community organics and the rest of it. And um, there's a strong line of questioning coming through the chat around, um, if people are concerned to um, actually redu reduce um, production levels, reduce exporting, um, if people are wanting to put in a submission that's really talking more about um, uh, commun you know, community um, waste reduction and recycling, organic waste, usually any opportunity to talk about waste reduction here, um, how can people put that in their submission when it comes to community composting, growing, um, that sort of stuff? Um, well, we are an exporting country, but it's just what we export. And should we be, um, there have also been questions around coal. Uh, and of course, the uh, emissions from, from agriculture and then the coal that is burnt by um, Fonterra to dry the milk to produce milk powder and export that is a problem. Uh, we certainly support using waste wood chip, uh, but often it's where those plantations are and how you get the chip uh, to the boiler plants. But James, through the um, one of the big funds, has been investing a lot, uh, government assistance in helping industries and schools switch from uh, coal boilers to uh, wood waste boilers. In terms of waste generally, the Emissions Reduction Plan has a whole chapter on waste. And one of the things that generates methane, of course, is organic matter, food waste, um, going into landfills. The bigger, more modern landfills have got a whole pipe network where they um, take off the methane and then use it to generate uh, electricity. The biggest renewable operation that generates electricity in the Auckland region is the Redvale uh, landfill. But uh, there's a proposal to uh, phase out food waste going to landfills by 2030. And that could then go, as we've got in Christchurch, Timaru and other areas, to um, large scale composting plants. And they can produce um, good compost for use on farm. Or uh, in places like Raglan, uh, zero waste Raglan is collecting um, food waste from households and composting that. So there are a lot of opportunities uh, for government to assist communities and councils move to composting solutions um, at that both uh, local scale, suburb scale, or a much larger citywide scale as we've got in um, Christchurch. In Auckland, council is talking about collecting food waste there, but then trucking it all the way to Reparoa for a um, anaerobic digester process, which in terms of looking at the emissions with transport is probably not that smart. So composting, whether it's at the home scale um, or the city scale, has a lot of potential, but we've got to look at how we um, ensure that we're not releasing methane through that. Yeah, and if I could just jump jump on there, I mean, I, I think it, it would be really good if we had a, a nas national food strategy, and I'm thinking about that in the context of, of the duopoly. The Commerce Commission kept brought out a report there was like major concerns that all of our supermarkets are owned by two Two, two companies, which means they can drive down, if they work together, they can drive down workers' wages and then put, put prices up as well. So um, one alternative was just to be add, to add another competitor to the market, but actually then you'll just end up having a triopoly when, then poss when possibly a better solution, and I, I support this solution, is uh, finding a way that you can have uh, uh, local, uh, local food producers, uh, Food co-ops to actually really break down their break down that the way that that food is distributed and, and managed to help producers actually get their stuff to the market without without that pressure from the from the duopoly. So it's a, a, if there are thoughts around how that could help um, in terms of reducing emissions, because if you if your uh, if your shop is not 
getting stuff all the way down from Auckland or from other places and it's getting stuff locally, well then that cuts down cuts down your emissions as well. And then you also have the other the benefit of supporting local local producers. Um, so some so some comments um, in that space would be good would be good. Great. Uh, very specific question here um, for you, uh, either of you, but maybe you, Eugenia, it's relating to forestry and how it um, is counted in the ECS. So if I'm putting you on the spot, um, sorry about that. It's about established native forests. So there's a question here. Um, are there incentives or disincentives to land kaitiaki trying to maintain established native forests, or do they have to drop them and replant them to benefit from the ETS scheme? Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that is one of the problems. It's only um, post-1990 forests that qualify for the ETS, hence this whole um, enthusiasm for planting pine. Um, pine does sequester more rapidly than indigenous species because they grow more slowly, but in the long term, you get a whole lot more benefits from indigenous. Uh, in terms of uh, Māori-owned land, uh, the Nafeno Rahui, which is associated with Te Papa Atafai, the Department of Conservation, can provide funding assistance to landholders to assist with pest control and fencing from stock. Um, but pre-1990, forests don't count in the ETS, and that's partly because of the international rules around carbon accounting. Thank you. It's probably slightly adjacent to the agriculture co-papa, but I thought it was a good question and worth asking. Sounds like something we do need to address. Um, another fairly specific one here, someone asking about uh, mounted solar arrays on farm. Um, there's probably a question there more broadly about, um, you know, what, what government support is provided, if any, to rural communities for um, energy transition and other sustainability transitions beyond just the growing of their food? Um, you know, in terms of their lifestyles and how they live and how they generate energy. Is that is that something worth putting in these submissions? The question was, is there any support for farmers to put in photovoltaics on farm? Because it can reduce ground temperatures and it can retain more, as well as generating electricity, of course. You go, Tiano, and then I will. Sure. Um, so, I mean, I, I mean, what, I, I mean, I think it would be worth, worth, worth putting in. Um, I, mean, I don't. Yeah, I mean, I. I I can't think of anything specifically out here, out here where that where that happens, but I think that would be a good solution. And I think um, just in terms of the amount of wind generation that we've got to establish and solar, um, with uh, wind turbines established on private farmland, there's obviously a rental um, paid, and similarly with solar. So I guess it is a matter of working with the energy companies in terms of what are their plans for development, uh, and where are they going to locate them, uh, and then yeah, working from there. Great. A um, few more to do. Uh, this is probably for you, Tiana. There's a question here around um, who are Parakori and Indigenous growing practices. Uh, where, it, where does that knowledge exist and how can we support communities to, to move back or, or move forward in an Indigenous growing, growing framework? Uh, well, I, I would say that the Indigenous knowledge stays, hold, is held by the Indigenous knowledge holders. And it's really important to 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 respect that and to, and to understand that as well. And but also to understand that you know a lot of uh, folks that uh, that live and work in that area, it's not just about trying to get some money. It's also about a way of living. Um, and I think it would be important that uh, that there would be there was more support around that because I think I think that's a good thing because there's all the there's all the benefits of uh, people that are living well with the land that are growing food. In a well a way that is good good with the land as well, but then there's that whole whole wider uh, narrative of um, holistic well-being of uh, connecting with Te Ao Māori, what that means for what that means for those communities as well. And it's it's something that's been talked about up at the COP as well in terms of you know what 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 does that mean internationally? Because we talk about Mātou and Māori, but in the global context, that's that's an, an, an indigenous knowledge, and you're talking. With some communities that have been living with the lands for you know thousands and thousands of years, and because they've had that and they've got that relationship, um, it is something that should be supported. Because when you do that, um, that helps. That's one of the ways that we can take climate action, right? Because it's supporting those those people and those communities that have that relationship with the environment and with nature, and they've done it in a way and have had the least impact 
and have had the, the, the least emissions of all the communities around the world, particularly in the Pacific. Well done. Uh, drawing to a close, I'm going to I'm going to put up to um, slightly higher level um, sort of political questions, really, um, less to do with uh, what people might put in their submissions, but more around uh, the urgency and the passion which we, people are feeling for the need for action on climate generally and on agriculture specifically. So um, we've got a series of questions that are coming in, really asking the question, what difference is this really going to make? Um, and expressing frustration that all of the demonstrations, the marches, you know, hasn't shifted, hasn't shifted the government's stance on, on how it's regulating emissions from agriculture. So can you give us your pitch for like, if people are going to submit something by the 24th of November, what's going to, you know, give us a pitch for why bother, if, if I can put it as bluntly as that. Because we live in a democracy and because people do influence government. And it is not just James Shaw as Minister of Climate Change that has got this responsibility. It's got to be all ministers and agriculture just hasn't woken up. And they still believe that relying on research, relying on a voluntary partnership, Hewaka Ekanoa, and relying on the goodwill of farmers, and many farmers are trying to change their practice, but the whole way the industry is structured and the financial incentives just don't um, encourage the scale of the change that we need. And the agribusiness sector, all of those who um, are around the farming industry, supplying them with tractors, fertilizer, uh, chemicals, they all profit from the current system. So that agribusiness lobby has had a huge impact. And so MPI has not really engaged. The public sector in New Zealand is always generally conservative. And so this eight summers that we have to really make a difference, putting in a lot of submissions will particularly give Labour the confidence that they can act here. Having won a lot of provincial seats, um, seats like Rangitata, uh, that they didn't expect to, they want to hang on to those, but they've got a higher responsibility of protecting the climate um, for now and the future. Kia ora. Yeah, and I, I would say um, uh, we have to just look, look back in our own history in the way that we've ch we challenged big business, and whether it's agribusiness, whether it's any old business, and that's just the coming together of people's movements. Uh, that's the coming together of environmentalists with um, Indigenous peoples, uh, with, with trade unions, uh, with rural communities, and with those with those farmers that actually recognise and need, and actually some of them are doing doing the mahi as well. And it's finding all those different groups and finding ways that we can connect and work together. That's that's where we get that synergy. And when you get that, when we have that movement, then we can put that pressure on on all those places that um, that Eugenie talked about. Um, I, I I see that as the solution. I see putting in a submission as just one part of that solution. Um, but I would encourage people to continue to to make those connections, support the people that are already doing it. That have those suggestions, uh, support those knowledge sets that are that are already there and have been here for a thousand years. Um, support those workers in those in those rural communities as well, because often their uh, folks are so busy thinking about thinking paycheck to paycheck that if you give them a pathway which shows which shows them, you know, actually you could do you could continue to 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 make to make some money for you and your you and your whanau, but it, it will also be in a way that makes sure that uh, we have clean rivers. We have a vibrant biodiversity, and also we've, we've sorted out climate change as well. So those are the things that we need to do to push back against big business, and in this case, agribusiness. Hold up. Right on. Well, I think we'll just go for some wrap-up comments. If you want to add anything else, summarise um, uh, what you've what you've heard today from the questions. If there, any questions you saw in the chat, either of you that you did want to address directly. Um, and then we'll, I'll pass to you, Tiana, right at the end um, to finish this off, if that's all right. Eugenie, um, do you want to go first? Well, I think um, just going back to that previous question too, just the judging by all of the questions in the chat, and I'm sorry we haven't been able to answer all of them, um, the huge uh, concern that people have. So it is taking, you know, 30 minutes maybe to do a submission to set out views. Um, the agricultural sector is, there are a lot of different people growing a lot of different things in a lot of different environments, but farmers in Aotearoa have always prided themselves on innovation, 
and it is recognising that as an exporting country who relies on the clean green image um, to sell a lot of those food and fibre products overseas, we have got to make that the reality. And increasingly, I think internationally, people are recognising the big disjunct between what we say about being clean and green and how we're not really doing our share uh, to protect the climate. And if farmers in um, Scotland, Ireland, elsewhere are making more of that shift, then we need to do that here. We can't just rely on the fact that traditionally um, we've had fewer emissions per kilogram of milk solids or meat uh, just to be complacent. And I think it is that complacency that has been the biggest problem. In countries like Scotland, um, where they're encouraging regenerative farming and talking more about a plant-based diet and that being part of the government's roadmap, um, we've got huge expertise in growing plant uh, plants and plant foods in Aotearoa and we need to export more of those. The horticultural sector, apple sector is an example of that, moving away from um, animal products and all of the emissions that uh, go with that. Kia ora. Uh, yeah, kia ora, just uh, following on what I was just saying. Uh, is, but I, I would encourage people to sort of to measure a few things as well. Um, how much how much uh, funding and PUTE is going to intensive, uh, intensive farming and intensive dairy and how much of it is actually going into organics and how much is going into regenerative practices. Take a look at it. Uh, why is there such a massive gap given the whole world is moving that way? Our international reputation depends upon it. International it's, and that and that's really important. That's one of your main trading cards on the international stage as well. We the Te Treaty or Waitangi is the is the fundamental constitutional document of our country as well, and it's also part of the part of the Greens Charter as well. Making sure that that is a solid part of all of this, particularly within agriculture, uh, recognizing the connections that Te Ao Māori has with the environment, and making sure that that's there as well is really really important. Uh, making sure that we. Uh, when we talk about these things, we have a community-wide approach, what it means for the community as a whole. You know, so your workers, uh, your part-time workers, your fences, your sheep, you know, sheep shearers, your sheep milkers, uh, you know, some of your small uh, small family businesses, your truck drivers, all that kind of thing. What, is, what does all of this mean for all of them as opposed to a, a small slice of a, of a very influential part of the agricultural sector as well? These are the things that we need to, to look at in order to move and get things done. Oh, tēnā koe, Tiano. Uh, koe, e do you want to finish us off? I'll just pass to Tiano for a closing karakia and we'll leave you all to the rest of your Sunday afternoons. Okay. Oh, tēnā tātou e te whānau. Uh, kia ora i, i, i whakarau i ka mai ki rarotu tūanui o tēnei zoi. Uh, Takia te tau karakia. Tēnei te Māori i tau i hona he mana atua, he mana tīpua. Kia tau, kia tau ki tēnei te maramatanga ki tēnei a tēnei o tātou. Tēnei te Māori i tau i hona he mana atua, he mana tīpua. Kia tau nga mana ki tanga ki tēnei a tēnei o tātou. Haumie hui e, tāhei ki e. Kia ora. Very good. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I understand for those of you we do have email addresses for, we might um, flick out some answers if we haven't been able to answer your questions. Uh, but apart from that, um, yes, have a good afternoon. <laughs>